Okay, we have some announcements this morning. One weekend for students sixth grade through 12th, uh, that is taking place. Um, one weekend with the closest friends, making lifelong memories and growing your relationship with God. Um, that uh, uh, tomorrow is the deadline for the sign up. So uh, I don't think anyone in here is going to be going, but uh, <laughs> just, just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, mom to mom, the, sept the spring semester of mom to mom begins Monday, February the 8th. Any moms with kids between birth and fifth grade are invited. The semester uh, will meet from 9.30 to 11.30 on February the 8th, the 22nd, March the 8th and 29th, April the 12th and 26th, and finish up on May the 10th. Uh, the cost is $40 and includes uh, childcare, study books, uh, crafts, guest speakers, et cetera. T-shirts are $5 extra, and the deadline to sign up is tomorrow, February the 1st. Um, baptism Sunday and new members class uh, will be Sunday, February the 7th. Um, and uh, the new members class is February the 14th and please let pastor jeremy know if anyone is interested <coughs> realm connect um we had a meeting this um past sunday to talk about the new application that our church is going to use the realm connect for communications uh to be able to find information on fellow members of our church, how to contact them. Um, but it's uh, for those that um, are involved in, in working here for the church in any type of capacity. It's the way they're going to communicate with us and, uh, and also a way to share messages with anyone about things that are coming up at our church uh, to be able to register for events and all. And if anyone hasn't had the opportunity, there is a, an app that you can download to your phone, iPhone. Uh, I think they even have it for other, other type phones. And it's a uh, it's really a, a, a neat tool to be able to communicate. And for us uh, here in, in our class would be a way for us to share information about get togethers whenever we can get together. But um, uh, yeah, really a, really a, a neat deal. And, and Robert and I had talked and um, said that we could even hold a Zoom class to help anyone uh, with questions that they might have about how to use the application to be able to communicate with other members and all. So, um, you also can uh, use it on your PC as well. So it doesn't, it's not just a tool for uh, iPhone connections or whatever, you can actually use it on your, uh, on your PC. So, uh, one last thing, the winter Bible conference, uh, this year, a Christ centered home, the annual conference will be held at the North Richmond Hills campus every evening every evening from february the 21st through the 24th 6 30 to 8 p.m uh and for those that are unable to get out in person each night will also be live streamed um, 
So we've got a great lineup of speakers each evening who, <clears throat> who will be preaching on how to have a Christ-centered home. Uh, meals will be available each evening prior to the conference, and you may purchase your meal tickets beginning next Sunday in the ministry gallery. So um, now those viewing online um gonna have to provide your own meals i'm sorry so, anyway hey, what, uh donna's trying to get on yes i said they won't deliver them no <laughs> you, you might work out something with grubhub or whatever <laughs> hi donna we can't see you but Donna, those are pretty ceiling lights. <laughs> Good morning. Good. We were just talking about uh, the Realm Connect and how we could use it here in our class to communicate about upcoming things for our class and all that, so. Y'all settle down in here. We'll be getting noise complaints from the room. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, we're, we're, we're just <laughs> waiting for Donna and Sammy to get hooked up oh, here. Okay. <laughs> Well, that made me like the OT Will's got going on there. It's nice. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. What is? I couldn't hear him. Huh? He couldn't hear what did he say? Something? Uh, he said he liked Will's whiskers. He's got going. Oh there. yes. <laughs> yes. The wisdom right there is seeping through. Right? Yeah. Matured Will. <laughs> All right. All right. Just keep it down. All right. Okay. All right. We'll try. Uh, Herb, uh, would you mind leading us in a okay. prayer? I might open it up and see if there's any other prayer requests, Herb. Thank you. <laughs> what about what about Lisa, Robert, and Donna? The start. You want to um, fill us? Yeah, I am. Not really a whole lot new. She was diagnosed with uh, lupus. Uh, she has celiac disease. She's uh, still undergoing some other doctor appointments and testing. They're checking out her uh, uh, intestinal tract and all that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, but appreciate your prayers. And uh, I think she's got, she's got a good attitude and uh, still able to keep some of her counseling appointments that she does online. So, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, thank you for your prayer support. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you. You know, one of the other things that I failed to mention about the Realm Connect, it's, it's a great way for us also to be able to, if anyone has a prayer request, uh, yeah, to tell, tell us about it whether it's midweek or whatever so so is it a, just an app that you go to it's you it's an app it? that it's an app yeah it's it's an app okay. and it's realm yeah. connect okay. so you can go to the app store yeah. download it and um, there is a I'll show you what mine looks like okay and and there is a uh, a link that is set out. You are set up on the other application. Mm -hmm. So you sh should have transferred onto the new new application. Okay. So, all right. I've asked Herb if he would mind. Well, I think Donna has. Oh, maybe. I'm sorry, Donna. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, one of our close friends her husband passed away yesterday morning. He was 50, and uh, his name was Frank Ortega. Oh, goodness. Ortega. Just remember her family. She has twins. They're 14 years old. 
and a 19 year old son. Her name is Amber. She teaches at Chisholm uh, Trail Middle School. Okay, mm -hmm. Amber Ortega and it was Frank. That's right. Amber Ortega and the name was Frank, her husband okay. Frank. All right. I'm gonna just send you a text so you'll get that correct. Would you mind just shooting me a text, Donna, on that? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do that. Thank you, thank you. Anything else? Anybody um, else? On there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you're always constant, always caring, loving in a changing world that we live in. Father, we lift these up, uh, several with physical issues. And Father, we just submit them to you as the great healer to touch and to heal, to restore, to recover, to give peace and strength, Father, and comfort to those in need. Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask you to give will your words, your guidance as he teaches the lesson. Go with us through the coming week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Mr. Will. Okay. You know, um, the pastor, teaching pastor mentioned during the service that, um, you know, said if you can, you know, read God's word, and worship and things, and you don't get a little bit uh, excited, feel blessed and good about that, well, you know, you may need to examine your relationship. And I, I was just thinking when he said that, I remember um, back before the plague hit <laughs> one Sunday, we had a visitor and he, he followed me out into the foyer and, I, and mentioned that he enjoyed lesson and I was uh, frankly uh, on my way quickly to the restroom <laughs> but I just mentioned to him that you know thank you I, I enjoy teaching but uh, the thing that I didn't get the chance to explain was that the reason I enjoy getting to teach is because it keeps me in the word you know I'm naturally kind of lazy <laughs> and um, this, really. this um, <laughs> having the assignment to teach, you know, keeps me in the word. It's not just um, just the reading of the word, but then you, you know, you got to kind of dig in when you're gonna gonna teach. And I got I've told people before, most of the time when you have to teach, um, you learn more than the students do. You learn more than the people that that are listening to you teach. And so that's that's a big reason why I like it. Today we're we're going to be doing a lesson uh, about uh, Jesus selecting about four of his first disciples, and you know it's a it's an interesting lesson. And if you go look in the other gospels, um, you don't really find the same thing, and it kind of makes you maybe makes you wonder. Um, you know what's going on but you know we've been told many times over our years of being in church that all four of the gospels of course are written by different people um written also in a little different times but they're also the the authors of those gospels were thinking about uh communicating with a specific group of people um matthew mainly to the jews the uh, Mark to the Romans, Luke to the Greeks, Gentiles, uh, John, uh, more of a spiritual setting. He's he's not one of the synoptics. You know, the, the, the other three gospels kind of go along the same line, but again, 
uh, some of the events that are in one gospel may not be in the other one. Uh, and some events are just in one gospel and not in, in the other two or three. Uh, and, you know, the reason that happens is because those authors had in mind communicating with a specific group of people or person, and, and they wanted to say things in the ways that would be best understood and, and, and best get the message across to that group of people. They were all, what they were all telling was exactly true, but it was just a, a different viewpoint on it to communicate with people. And the same thing is true here with the disciples. Uh, we're going to go through a lesson here in, in Luke 5, starting verse 4, and it's, and it's a lesson about Jesus is selecting some of these first disciples, but if you look at the other four Gospels, it doesn't quite appear to happen the same way, um, but it's, some of them just have a very short statement about it and 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 move on it's a it's a it's a little in fact uh, scholars really don't always agree on the sequence of when he selected his disciples but we do have at least two two gospels that have a list of the 12 disciples uh, that that agree and um, so it you know we're gonna we're gonna go through this account um and, and see how Luke put it down. Now, Luke, probably one of the more educated authors uh, in, in the Bible, uh, or in the, at least this, uh, uh, the gospel accounts. And, and he was, of course, writing, and it says that earlier, that's Theopolis, and, and frankly, we don't know if that was a real guy or it was just a vehicle to help him uh, share his story with Theopolis. Uh, it would be in a Greek name. It was a Greek person. Um, some people feel like it could have been his former owner. You know, it, Luke was a doctor. Most doctors were slaves. Uh, they were doctors for wealthy families, and it could have been that Luke, this Theopolis, would have been his former owner who got to be best friends with this doctor and slave, and perhaps the doctor really did some outstanding things, and, and, and he gave him his freedom, and, and so Luke ends up, you know, traveling with Paul quite a bit, and, and that kind of thing, but um, just remember, Jesus as we look at these accounts, Jesus always went and found people where they were, but he didn't leave them there. He ended up sometimes giving them a new name, and all of them, he gave them a new purpose, and that's what we're going to look at today, and if you go down to Luke 5 and verse 4, and, and we're just going to work our way uh, through these first uh, 4 to 11, um, you know, I Jesus was walking down the shores of, of the Sea of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee, and he had he'd already been it started attracting a large group of people, and they were all kind of pushing to get up close to him because they wanted to hear anything he had to say, and, and probably also uh, many of them wanted to make sure they could see in case he stopped and healed someone or something. That, you know, that was a rather dramatic thing to be going on, and as he walked on the shore, it says he saw two boats up ahead that were pulled up to the shore. Um, now, you got to realize these were commercial fishing vessels. Sometimes I've had the idea, I know what, at least when I was younger, that these were just little old boats, maybe 10 or 12 feet long, um, a little sail on it, and, and Peter, you know, going fishing. Um, but these boats could have been more like 30 feet long, had a crew of at least three or four men, and they put out big nets uh, that that would encircle a big area, and then they would draw it up, probably drawing up the bottom ropes on those nets first, 
and then the top ropes coming in too, and it would just form a big pocket and trap a lot of fish, they hoped. Um, but um, just selected this one boat, the boat of Simon, and I don't think he did it accidentally. I think he knew that was Simon's boat, and he was there to to call Simon. Uh, and so he, he, he says they were out on the beach already washing their nets. And probably when they saw this crowd coming, I can imagine those nets are pretty expensive. They didn't want them trampled by a crowd, and maybe getting torn. They probably started getting the nets back up on the boat. And Jesus comes up and asks Simon if, if he could get on his boat and Simon would push off just a little bit so that Jesus and this bow, this big boat would be up higher so he could see the crowd better and he could teach them. Now, Peter um, already knew something about Jesus. Uh, if, you, if you go back over to, uh, I think it's maybe, uh, I, I had it written down here, but I wouldn't, wouldn't I think, he went over, he, he had been brought to Jesus by, by Andrew, his brother. Remember when Andrew evidently was a disciple of John the Baptist. Um, and when uh, John pointed to Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God. And Andrew started following Jesus. And then Andrew went and got his brother Simon and brought him to Jesus. And so they had already met. Uh, Simon probably knew this man. There was something a little different about him. He was special. He knew what uh, that John the Baptist had pretty well proclaimed that he, he was the Messiah. Of course, the, the Jews have been looking for a Messiah for hundreds of years. And there had been other false messiahs to come along. So they weren't, you know, really buying into everything just on the basis of John the Baptist's word. And, and um, of course, he had to go make a living. So he went back to his boat and he had gone fishing. And now... They're back there cleaning their nets, and Jesus comes up, and, and he asked to get on the boat for Simon where he could teach the people. And when he gets through teaching the people, um, look down there at verse 4. It says, and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a, cake, a catch. Um, <laughs> I would bet that if Simon hadn't already known Jesus, he'd have said, Kind of, as we might jokingly put it today, no way, Jose. I'm not. <laughs> we've been working all night. We're tired. We're just getting the nets cleaned up, and we're going to go home, go to bed. And but knowing Jesus and knowing that he was something special, Simon's response was, "Master, we've toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I'll let down the nets." Um. I'm sure the, the, the guys, his crew, were probably grumbling a little bit because they figured they were fixed to get to go home and rest too. But now Simon, and he's the boss, and he orders them to put out there and, and, and let down these nets. And um, again, those, those, those were big nets. They, they used a big net to kind of, they put them out in a big circle and, and then they drew them in to catch these fish in a big pocket and, and get them in the boat. And they'd been, they'd been pulling those nets all night. They'd been <laughs> circling that boat in, in key places. And night evidently was the best time to catch fish. Here it was in the morning, beginning to get warm. They had worked all night. It, it wasn't a good time to fish. But Peter didn't, didn't point much of that out to Jesus that this wasn't a good time or anything. He just says, hey, at your word, um, I'll let down the nets. 
and and you know this and he, note how, how he addresses Jesus. He calls him Master. Uh, that in those days that was a little bit like saying, uh, "Sir, at your word, I'll let down the net." You know, it's it was just a a, a form of respect, uh, a form of somebody that's had a little bit of authority. You know, they're maybe a little bit higher than you. You know, it's kind of like you'd say to your boss, or, you know, he tells you you need to do something, he's you just got to say, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's kind of what Peter was doing there with Jesus at that point. Um, it's the same word that they did. You know, remember when Jesus was on the boat and the storm hits and he's asleep in the bow? Um, they called him master at that point. Uh, same, same word. It's a little short of calling him Lord, uh, which would be like, you know, a king or a supreme boss. Or something. But um, you got to wonder, why did Jesus want to give Simon this big catch of fish? Um, what, what's going on? You know, he, Simon had gone to some trouble to gather up the nets, get them in the boat, and then Jesus asking to push off a little bit so, and, and stay there where they he could teach the crowd. Um, probably Simon was also interested in hear, being able to hear what Jesus taught the crowd um, because he knew there was something special about this, this man, Jesus. But after working all night and, and getting ready, you know, just about ready to go home and, and this Jesus shows up and asks him to out further the, the the message is over and he's thinking probably Jesus is going to get down and, and go his way but instead he asked Simon to put the boat out into the deep and let out their nets and Simon you know says sir uh, since it's you asking I'll do it uh, I wouldn't do this for anybody but since you're asking, I'll do it. And it says in verse six, it says when they had done this, they had closed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. Uh, and you notice it says since they had done that, uh, indicates there is a crew on that boat. It wasn't just, and Peter did this, and Simon did this. It was a crowd, I mean, a, a crew, probably about four guys. You know, when, the, when there wasn't any wind to fill their sails, these guys had to row that boat. And so, you know, and, and, and with all of the, the big nets, uh, anybody ever fished or some fishing with big nets? Um, being raised down on the coast of Texas, um, I have seen big nets. Uh, they put out big nets, maybe... Uh, 200 foot of nets and go out from the beach. I've also do it from the beach. Go out from the beach is about as far as I can kind of get out and, and make a big, big pocket, come back into the beach, way down the beach, and then that get up and drag the nets down. Those nets are big and heavy and a lot of work. And, and that's what these guys have been doing. And there were probably at least four of them uh, where they were on both sides of those nets, pulling them in. And here they catch this huge catch of fish, so much so that it's beginning to break their nets. I am betting they had never seen a catch like this before. They had never even heard about a catch like this before. These were, there were fish, fish, and more fish, and, 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 and this net, which they're built pretty stout, uh, was even beginning to tear. And, and they signaled their partners in the other boat. Remember, there's two boats pulled up there. And their partners in the other boat, I, I'm suspecting that these boats a lot of times work uh, together. Uh, it's easier to string out the nets and, and, and work together with two boats. Plus, the Sea of Galilee was a pretty dangerous place. Uh, Sometimes from Mount Hermon on the north, 
these fronts would move down unexpectedly and hit that lake. If any of you know about lake water, uh, it gets rough fast. Lake water, fresh water gets rough faster than, than seawater because seawater is heavier. And, but that, that lake get bad fast and Simon and all the fishermen uh, knew of people that had been out on the lake and got caught in the storm and went under, but two boats had a better chance than just one. So they, they went out together and, and you had this, these partners and they pulled their boats over and, and crew came over too and, and started filling their boat. I, I, I kind of wondered how they, Fill the boat. It wasn't, I mean, they were pulling these nets in. They have this big pocket of fish. And of course, fish are flopping and jumping around. And, and there, some of them are coming in with the nets. But I'm kind of wondering maybe if they had a dip net or something. They were dipping into that mass of fish and throwing them back into the boat. And, and this partner boat pulls around and, and grabs onto the nets too and, and are holding them up and, and, and getting fish. And it says they got so much, so many fish in both the boats, they began to sink. Now, if this was about a 30 foot boat, that's probably 10 or 12 feet wide in the middle, and, and you got it so full, it's beginning to sink. Boy, you got a lot of fish. <laughs> you got a, a, a humongous amount of fish. And, and uh, so it, it's, it's, Quite an, quite an event. In fact, it, 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 nothing like this has ever happened to these guys before, period. And, and it says there in verse eight, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus's feet and said, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Uh, notice, it says that Simon saw it. I don't think it just means that he just saw all these fish. He saw that this was a, 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 an event that could not be explained in physical terms. This just didn't kind of accidentally happen that they enclosed this big catch of fish. He knew that Jesus had something going the i'm sure at this point he didn't understand but he knew that this man was a a holy man a, a at least some kind of big uh, prophet something that had caused this to happen and simon says hey depart from me for i'm a a sinful man oh lord notice he calls him lord there he's not He's not just master, not he's not just sir. He's, he said, oh, Lord, you, he recognizes Jesus's authority. And it's not just Jesus being an authoritative teacher. There's something more about this man, Jesus. And Peter recognizes that, man, I'm not even fit to be in his presence. And, and he's actually kind of scared about what's what's happened and what's going on and, and about who who this man is he says for all for he and all that were with him in verse 9 were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken all that were with him that include all of his crew that include the 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 partners in the other boat which we find out are are who You remember, look down a little further, it says it's James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Uh, later they're called also the sons of thunder. I'm wondering if they just make a lot of noise. <laughs> uh, the sons of thunder. Uh, all that were with him were astonished at the catch. And also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And, and you notice... Uh, in this next verse, Jesus never speaks to to uh, James and John. He only talks to Peter. And you kind of you kind of wonder why Peter. Well, you know, the, it says that they're partners. Uh, 
I'm picturing in my mind anyway that James and John are probably younger than Peter. James, John may have been only about 15 or 16 years old. Of course, he's a man at 13 in Jewish life. But he was a, a young guy. His brother may be a little bit older, James. And then Peter was probably the oldest of, of the three. And he was, my mind picturing, he was a big brawny guy. Um, he, you know, when he spoke, people listened. <laughs> and I'm kind of figuring they might have been partners, but I bet you that Peter was a senior partner. Uh, and he pretty well ran the show. Um, so Jesus knew that too. Jesus knew Peter was a leader. And he was wanted to call Peter, but he was going to call James and John too. But he wanted to call Peter and he speaks to Peter and he says, do not be afraid. Um, and I'm sure that kind of helped calm Peter a little bit that Jesus told him, hey, don't be afraid. He, and what does he do? He says, from now on, you'll be catching men. Peter spent all his life up to that point catching fish. And now Jesus says, you're going to be catching men. He, uh, Still going to be in the catching business, but he's going to be catching men instead of fish. And it said, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now, we don't get any details about how this really happened, but I'm figuring uh, when all this, this didn't happen far from shore, and Peter, James, and John all had extended family there in this village. And some of them had probably been down there near the beach when their their folks came in with the boats, may have been even helping them kind of wash and clean the nets. And when all this tremendous catch of fish starts and they can see what's happening, all these fish coming, I'm betting that, that some of them were running back into the village and gathering all the baskets they could get to, to help bring in that, that catch. And we know Peter was, at least was married, could have been James or John, could have been married. Uh, we, don't, we don't know, they don't, they don't share all those details. Hey, and, and, and Peter married, he could have had two or three, four kids as far as we know, but that's not part of the story. So we don't get that out of, out of the gospels. It's, it's, they're telling the story primarily about Jesus. And, and so the Gospels don't share with us a lot about all the particulars of life. We wouldn't know that Peter had a wife unless it was from the event when Jesus went to Peter's house and found his wife was sick and running a fever, and Jesus healed her, and she got up then and, and, and helped to serve them. Um, other than that, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have known. Uh, it doesn't tell us anything about the rest of the extended family, but most of the times all these families live close together, maybe even shared housing uh, with extended family. It's kind of like in the Philippines. Sometimes you'd have a mom and dad and five or six kids and a grandma or granddad or both and, and an auntie or two, an aunt, uncle, uh, all living together in one little house. And, and that's kind of what was going on, I'm sure, in, in these villages back in those days. And so, uh, you know, for the first time, too, you've got Luke. How did he refer to, to, to Simon? He refers to him as this is the first time you find the words Simon Peter. Remember, Jesus gives Peter this name of Cephas or in the, in the Greek would have been, that's Aramaic, and the Greek would have been Peter, Petros, the rock. And, and this man, Peter, the fisherman, and who's getting a new assignment to be a fisherman of men, was going to be the rock, that rock of faith. Remember, Jesus later tells Peter, said, upon this rock, I'm gonna build my church. He wasn't talking about Peter, he was talking about the faith that Peter had that kind of saving faith 
was going to be the faith that Jesus would build his church on. Peter, the rock. And, and so it says, when Peter saw it, he saw not just the fish, but this evidently supernatural event that was going on. And, and, and he asked Jesus to part from him, depart from him. But Jesus says, hey, don't be afraid because I'm going to make you a fisherman of men. And, and then uh, it has James and John, the sons of Zebedee, those, those sons of thunder that were partners with Simon in this commercial fishing business. And they too says they left everything and followed him. Um, I'm thinking that probably some of the crew from both of these ships were one or more of them was very trusted and they just said, hey guys, we're going with Jesus. Y'all take care of the ships and take care of the families and, and, and we're out of here. And so they leave and go with Jesus. Now next week, Robert's going to do a lesson that comes next in, in the scripture about uh, Jesus healing the, the lame man that, you know, let down through the, the ceiling. Uh, but we're going to skip that one and, and move down to uh, Jesus calling a fourth disciple. Uh, down in, in verse 27, 28, it says, and he went out. Again, don't give, Luke doesn't give a lot of details. That's not necessary to tell the story that he's wanting to tell about Jesus. It just says, and afterwards he went out. Well, it could have been that his healing of the lame man and, and the, the teaching event that he had there uh, in that, that house where he healed the lame man could have happened in the morning. And that afternoon, he goes out. But it could have been a day or two later. We, we don't really know. It just says, and after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth and said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Now, again, it, it kind of almost sounds like it happened accidentally. Um, I don't think it was any more an accident of him going and seeing Levi and calling him than it was that an accident that he got in Simon's boat. Uh, Jesus knew Levi. We don't have any indication that they had ever met, but evidently Levi knew who Jesus was, or he wouldn't have just got up and left everything. I don't, I don't picture that as, as being very realistic. Uh, he, Levi could have been one of those that was going to listen to John the Baptist preach. People from all over were going out to hear this man preach in the wilderness and call people to repentance. Levi could have been one of those that was repenting. But you notice he was a tax collector. <laughs> tax collectors were the scum of the earth so far as Jews were concerned. One, tax collecting, uh, I get the picture that the Romans didn't pay tax collectors much of anything. They were a servant, but they didn't get paid Anything. The very reason that the Romans expected them to cheat <laughs> and pocket the difference, uh, you know, if if if, if there was a uh, hundred dollars worth of tax owed, they'd tell the guy maybe it's a hundred and fifty. And a lot of these tax collectors had a little contingent of Roman soldiers around to help reinforce the collection of the taxes. So you couldn't really argue with them very much. You had to pay your taxes. And everybody knew how they cheated. Plus, who did the, who did the Jews hate the most? Well, they hated the Romans. They, they didn't like hardly any, in quote, Gentiles. But they hated the Romans because the Romans ruled over them. And, and they, like most nations the Romans ruled over would 
have loved to have their independence. And that's what they were, the Jews were really thinking that the Messiah was going to come and, and, and establish a, a mighty army and drive out the hated Romans and reestablish the kingdom of, of David and Solomon and, and everything was going to be great again. Um, they didn't read Psalm 51, did they? <laughs> you know, they just, they just, they just, like we do, we hear what we want to hear sometimes. We see what we want to see. And, and yeah, we also refuse to hear and see what we don't want to hear that makes us uncomfortable or the things that we don't like. And, and, and the Jews were guilty of that just like we are often today. Uh, but Jesus didn't accidentally just see this man Levi sitting at the tax collector's table and see him. I, I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking that Levi may have even followed Jesus and heard him teach before, and and Levi probably kind of came up through the crowd where Jesus was teaching and and. Frankly, people knew that Levi was a tax collector. He was kind of some, almost like a leper. You know, nobody wanted to even touch him. And, and he got up through the crowd. And, and, and I'm just picturing in my, my mind's eye that he was listening to Jesus teach. And Jesus was teaching. And as Jesus taught, at one point, maybe Jesus looked right at Levi. And Levi just felt his heart nearly jump out of his chest. Uh, we don't know. It's not in the story. But when J Jesus came to Levi and said, follow me, he couldn't wait to get up and leave. Says he left everything. Uh, his livelihood was very lucrative. And he was getting up and leaving that lucrative livelihood to follow a man that certainly wasn't promising him anything materially. He wasn't going to get rich following Jesus. Just like Peter, James, and John weren't going to catch any fish following Jesus. And, and he just says, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Um, I think Jesus certainly knew who Levi was, but Levi also certainly knew who Jesus was before before Jesus called him. And, and he probably just couldn't believe his, his fortune of, of the fact that this very holy man, possibly the Messiah, would have called him a hated tax collector to come and follow him, be one of his disciples. You know, Jesus still calls people to follow him. And, and they're not, they don't have to be special people, not holier than thou people, just everyday common ordinary people. I bet if you go back and, and, and look at our different pastors from Jeremy, our teaching pastor, our senior pastor, you go back and look at their background, they weren't really anything special. They just got called by God and were willing, willing to, to follow. Uh, I guarantee you, Darlene and I, there wasn't nothing special about us. We got called to be missionaries. I mean, I was a principal of a school out in West Texas and, and Darlene, housewife, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have anything special going on that I know of. <laughs> it's just the fact that reading Bible one day and Jesus just pretty well planted in my head just as clear as I, I could get that if you're not going to do what I've asked you to do, I'm going to stop asking. And frankly, that got my attention. <laughs> and, and we ended up following and serving for that 30 plus years over in the Philippines. But I'm sure Robert and Diana got the same kind of same kind of witness, same kind of story, uh, and and nearly everybody. Jesus doesn't call just holy people; he calls common, everyday, ordinary people. And when they trust him, 
and believe in him and are willing to try to obey him, he can do some special extraordinary things with their lives. And, and certainly we have here, if you get to looking at Peter, James, John, Levi, you know who Levi is? Levi is Matthew. Matthew, the tax collector. Go look at the list of the disciples in a couple of places. Levi wrote the first, what is to us, the first gospel. Of course, Mark really wrote the first gospel. Mark is the earliest gospel ever. All the scholars pretty well agree. Uh, John, it's the same John that writes the gospel of John, that writes the revelation. Um, yeah, uh, these are kind of, this is kind of a group of, of special people. Peter, the guy that pretty well became the leader of those disciples. Um, that rock that ends up, as, as legend says, that he ends up getting uh, crucified uh, in Rome. And when they were going to crucify him, he told them he wasn't worthy of being crucified like Jesus to put him upside down. And so they obliged him and nailed him on a cross upside down. Um, we don't have that in a authoritative record, but the early church fathers and that, that story about Peter uh, went around. And, you know, he, he uh, Levi, if you go down to verse 29 and 30, Levi says, made a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. Uh, again, we don't know if that was uh, later that day. Uh, seems like it would take a little while to put together a, a great feast. I mean, they probably had some, uh, all kinds of different meats and fish and uh, uh, then it says he had to, you know, go and invite all of his friends. And you notice who were primarily his friends? What does it say there? Other tax collectors. Yeah, other tax collectors. Nobody else would have anything to do with him other than other tax collectors and their families and immediate friends. These guys were, were outcasts so far as the Jews were concerned. And, and they were kind of the table and the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Ooh. You know, they didn't approach Jesus. They grumbled at the disciples. Now, two things was probably happening there. One's the physical location. Jesus was probably at kind of an honored place ahead of the table up there with Levi and, and, and his best friends. The disciples were scattered around the other end and perhaps near the window, near the door. And these Pharisees kind of grumbled at them. I, I like that word grumble. It's, 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 a, it's kind of like the Old Testament murmur. Remember the murmur, murmur, murmur? The, the Israelites were kept murmuring against Moses in the wilderness and, and here they're grumbling and that grumbling, <laughs> some of you may remember a cartoon of a bear family that the old man, the old bear, the father bear was, things were going on and he would be going, well, I don't know why we ought to do this. We ought to just, and he just grumbled. <laughs> and that's kind of the picture you get from these uh, scribes and Pharisees. They're, they're whispering over to the, oh, why in the world are you guys, if, if, if this is really a holy man, if Jesus is what he claims to be and, 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 and you're good, God wouldn't have you associating with these tax collectors and sinners, you know, um, but if you notice too, uh, Jesus didn't give his disciples much of a chance to answer um, they hadn't approached Jesus, you know, they hadn't tried to ask him across the room, uh, but they had asked his disciples. Uh, they questioned really whether 
Jesus and those disciples could truly be men of God if they were willing to associate with this kind of sinful group. Um, holy people only associated with holy people. <laughs> righteous people only were supposed to associate with, with righteous people. Certainly you wouldn't be friends with these down there, those scum of the earth type sinners. Remember, remember that time in the temple when Jesus and the disciples were there and, and they had this tax collector and he was he was beating his chest and asking God to forgive such a sinner like him. And, and the Pharisee was over there praying, God, thank you that I'm not like this sinner, indicating the, this, this, this tax collector over there, this bad sinner that was beating his chest and asking for God's forgiveness. And what did Jesus say about the two men? He said that tax collector beating his chest and asking for God's forgiveness and mercy was better than, holier than, more right than that Pharisee over there praying to God and, and thanking him for how great he was. <laughs> yeah, um, that's the kind of mindset that, that they're dealing, dealing with there. And so in their mind, you couldn't be a holy man and associate with these terrible sinners. But Jesus heard it, knew it. Hey, remember when he, next week, Robert's going to share, but remember these guys that were grumbling against Jesus as he, when he healed this lame man, they didn't even evidently say it out loud, but Jesus knew their thoughts. Well, here, Jesus knew what they were grumbling about, whether he could hear them or not. And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Uh, a good Jewish method of, of teaching was, you know, giving illustrations like this. And Jesus did it all the time, all these parables, all these stories. And Jesus says, hey, a physician doesn't waste time trying to doctor people that are well. He's, his job is to doctor people who are sick. And then parallel to that, he comes back and says, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners into repentance. Uh, you know, these religious leaders thought they were righteous. They thought they were holy men. They followed the law. They gave the sacrifices. Uh, they did all of the mechanical things of worship. If they had songs, they sang the songs. You know, we sing the hymns. And we give our offerings, and and we we come to church. Uh, we could easily be about like some of these scribes and Pharisees, thinking that that's what made us right. But Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinner. Now, he wasn't saying that these guys were righteous, but he was recognizing that they thought they were righteous. And since they thought they were righteous, they weren't opening, they weren't open to hearing God's message and, and, and repenting because they didn't think they had anything to repent about. But these tax collectors, they knew they were sinners. They knew that they weren't right with God. I mean, people shunned them. People stayed away from them. People didn't want to have anything to do with them. They were, in essence, told every day that they were sinners. They were not good people. And so they recognized their need for repentance and their need for God. Uh, if you go over to Matthew 23 and, and just kind of go down through and look at the start of the paragraphs and, and look at what Jesus says all through that whole chapter, he's saying scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, and then he goes on to teach. 
and he gets teaches that point and then he starts over again scribes pharisees hypocrites and and, and he goes on again uh he, he certainly wasn't saying that these people were righteous i have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance in a essence he was saying i've not come to call people who think they're doing great i'm come i've come to call people who know they they need god's forgiveness and and hey that's probably good news for all of us we know we know we're sinners uh, we know we need god's grace and god's mercy and certainly god's help to live more like he wants us to do and, and hey it's good news too this lesson's good news i mean if if jesus wants to associate with somebody that nobody wanted to, no no good jew wanted to be around and if he wanted and was willing to forgive and to have one of those to follow him then the good news is that hey <laughs> we certainly can follow too no matter what we've done, who we are, who we were, God can call us. He can give us a new name. He can give us a new purpose. And just like these first disciples, knowing Christ and following Christ, um, I mean, just kind of like our pastor, teaching pastor said this morning that that his promises for his people are our promises. And we going into eternity as the benefactor, benefactors for, for those promises. Um, any comments, questions? about that great lesson great lesson. It's, a, it's a good lesson for me <laughs> you know um certainly wasn't anything special about me um a little a little tall skinny guy from a little bitty town uh, that wasn't really noted for much of anything, but praise the Lord, God had a a calling and a task for us to do, and we tried to do it. Um, and, and and you know, one of the things that just like teaching, sometimes people have commented and said they enjoy my teaching and all this. Hey, the Lord does it. You know, he he just he gives. Uh, we get to take, <laughs> you know, um, and, and these first four guys that he, that he calls all ended up having very special roles that we still benefit from today. And, and that's just the way God works. They, hey, a fisherman? Um, I just, uh, I mean, you could have been a, hey, an air conditioner repairman, could have worked at a bank, right? <laughs> could, could have uh, worked for the county or the state or, you know, any kind of, any kind of job. God can still use you. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't mean, hey, I'm not anybody important enough for God to do something with. You don't have to, be, God calls people according to his will and his purpose and then he gives them the gifts to do what he wants them to do if they're willing to obey and if they're willing to follow him um i get i get people back from especially you know that knew me in the philippines and and all and 
and and you know that Christian publishing organization that we built over there got to be big and it got to be very influential and, and a lot of people say, man, you did a great job and all this, but no, you look back on it. I can just confess to you very easily that, that God just did some extra special things that, that made that happen and put it together. And I just got to be part of it. I mean, he gave some special employees. Uh, he, he gave us some special opportunities. He gave us some special authors and, 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 and God just did it. I, it, it, it was fun to be part of it. And, and I think you'll find that same thing when you're willing to, to just go ahead and, and, and do it. Uh, you're going to find that it's, Hey, it was fun to do. <laughs> God blessed you. It may not have been easy and it may not have been all, um, level ground or downhill <laughs> easy, but uh, you're going to look back on it and know it was one of the best times in your life. So I think we just need to be like Simon, Peter, James, John, Levi, just be willing to get up and go and do when we know we should, because it's going to end up being a greater blessing than anything we left behind. Next week, the title of the lesson is Forgives. Um, and it's about whether or not Jesus had the authority or power to forgive sins. So we'll let, I won't steal Robert's thunder. He can develop that one for next week. So. I hope you all have a, a good week. Everybody stays well. And I hope um, all of us can end up someday getting a vaccine and start having the class all back together again. This COVID will go away. And don't come back another day. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. As Floyd used to say. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's close a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that you do use us. Uh, no matter how unworthy we are, you're worthy. No matter how unknowing and, and, and uh, unskillful that we are, you can give us everything we need to do the things that you've asked us to do. And we just praise you and bless you for it. Be with all the folks in this class. Be with these that, especially that are having some real health problems and medical problems. Uh, just be with them in a special way this day and help us to, to, to be the people that you'd have us to be in ministering to others and being faithful witnesses for you. And we'd ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great one. All right. Robert. Thank you, Will.